Hello and welcome to our April edition of Voices for the West, a monthly webinar series brought to you by Advocates for the West. My name is Will Shoemaker and I am Communications and Engagement Director at Advocates for the West. For those new to us, we are a public interest, nonprofit environmental law firm providing free legal services to conservation organizations, Native American tribes, and concerned citizens in all 11 Western states. The title of tonight's webinar is Wildlife Migration, Paths Worth Protecting, in which we will be dis discussing primarily work to protect the path of the pronghorn in Western Wyoming. We are grateful to be joined by Linda Baker of the Upper Green River Alliance and Advocates for the West's own staff attorney, Sarah Stelberg. Unfortunately, Garrett v uh, Visser from Idaho Wildlife F uh, Federation is not able to join us this evening as originally planned. We certainly will miss Garrett this evening, but are excited nonetheless to discuss this important matter. If you are new to Voices for the West, first off, we welcome you. And second, I want to highlight a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your screen, you should see the chat section. And as is typical for Voices for the West webinars, I have a request of you, our attendees. So that we can better get to know each other this evening, please take a minute and drop into the chat a species of wildlife that's important to you whose survival depends on long distance migration. I am writing into the chat now myself, mule deer in the Gunnison Basin. That is in Colorado where I live. Uh, you will remain on mute throughout uh, the course of tonight's presentations. However, we do welcome your questions. If a question comes to mind at any point during the talks, feel free to go ahead and drop it into the Q&A section. That is also located at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it's different from the chat, um, and you don't have to wait until the end of the talks in order to do so. We'll get to as many of those questions as time allows toward the end of tonight's presentations. Let's see. Folks uh, are saying pronghorn and monarch butterflies, sublet mule deer, pronghorns. Thanks for, for sharing that. We are honored to be joined tonight by Linda Baker. Linda has lived in the Upper Green River Basin of Western Wyoming for 41 years and is executive director of the Upper Green River Alliance. Linda. Thank you, Will, and thank you for adv to Advocates for the West uh, for hosting this Voices for the West webinar. Um, and thank you, Sarah, for all your hard work um, on our efforts together. Um, I'm going to go ahead and begin my presentation. And let's see, hopefully this will work. Okay, so many of you may have visited Western Wyoming and have seen our miraculous pronghorn migration, but for those of you who haven't, welcome. Um, I, I would be glad to show any of you around if you ever get to the Upper Green River Basin. For more than 6,000 years, pronghorns have lived in what is now Western Wyoming. Pronghorns thrived here, before the abacus or the alphabet, before iron or the invention of the wheel. Throughout the desert along the Green and New Fork Rivers and under the Wind River Range along the Great Divide, they have browsed the ripening spring and rich summer ranges of the Green River Valley. With herds of bison and elk, mule deer and moose, they have carved passages in the sand and you can see them migrating here at the bottom of the screen. The path leads over a pass at the head of the Green River to the Grovant River Valley and down into Jackson's Hole. They follow with fidelity the mystery of migration, a long kept secret. With the Tetons on the horizon, 
What is now Grand Teton National Park lies below. Wildlife biologist and friend Joel Berger wrote, pronghorn represent a Grand Teton megafauna that also includes bison, moose, mule and white-tailed deer, elk and bighorn sheep that the public expects to view and enjoys viewing. Their loss would impoverish this park. The amazing spectacle of pronghorn migrating through this valley, crossing the desert on trails that are thousands of years old and fording the icy green river between snowdrifts in the spring is a thrilling, life-affirming experience that may someday vanish. Once weather hints at fall and the coming of the cold, they return to the Green River Valley and spread out to the coves and shelters of the hills and mesas that cut the wind and uncover the snow. The Upper Green River Basin is where winter range sustains pronghorn through the harshest weather, such as this winter. The path of the pronghorn provides the way to winter ranges that have been used for centuries with unwavering fidelity. If they can't get to sagebrush not covered with snow, they will die. This is the path of the pronghorn. For 25 years, people who know have mapped the migration route, shown here in red. With aircraft and field observations, biologists have shown us this ancient route and published in peer-reviewed journals. As you can see, the migration corridor extends from Grand Teton National Park to the lower reaches of the Green River Basin. Paul Sawyer and Fred Lindsay wrote, the primary management concern for pronghorn populations in Western Wyoming is the maintenance of winter ranges and migration corridors. In 2005, based on professional knowledge, Sawyer, Lindsay, and McWhorter published this map and report in the Wildlife Society Bulletin. Again, the pronghorn migration route with highest use is clearly outlined from Grand Teton National Park to the Southern Green River Basin. They wrote, identification and protection of migration corridors and bottlenecks will be necessary to maintain mule deer and pronghorn populations throughout their range. In 2006, the Wildlife Conservation Society was contracted by gas field operators to conduct a five-year study on pronghorn in the quote-unquote treatment area of the Pinedale Anacline gas field. The study included less disturbed control areas to compare results. Pronghorn were located all through the Southern Green River Basin, as you can see here. Paul Sawyer, John Beckman, Renee Seidler, and Joel Berger wrote, pronghorn response to energy development involves both avoidance of infrastructure and partial abandonment of their traditional winter ranges. In 2008, Bridger Teton National Forest Supervisor Niffy Hamilton issued a final decision to designate the first federally designated migration corridor, corridor in the United States. She wrote, the pronghorn, Antelope carpa americana, that summer in Jackson Hole, migrate annually between there and wintering areas in the Green River Basin. Documented round trip migration distances from 175 to 330 miles make this the longest known terrestrial animal migration in the 48 contiguous states. While this designation is a huge benefit to the sublet pronghorn herd, it only protects the migration corridor on far Forest Service land here. The migration corridor continues south to crucial winter ranges on BLM land, but neither the BLM nor the state of Wyoming has to date designated the path of the pronghorn in its entirety. This is what we seek. Path of the pronghorn designation and protection along its entire length to preserve its integrity, to recognize its importance, and to allow pronghorn full access to the seasonal ranges they need to survive. In 2012, the Trappers Point overpasses and underpasses 
were completed at a cost of $10 million to help pronghorn and mule deer cross a busy highway along their traditional migration route. However, if the path of the pronghorn is not designated and protected along its entire length, these bridges, these are bridges to nowhere. This valley is rich in history and tradition and energy under the ground. As natural gas wells are developed, they disturb migration that has been in place for thousands of years. The Wildlife Conservation Society wrote, patches of habitat, which were predicted to be of very high use by pronghorn in the winter inside the Pinedale Anacline and Jonah gas fields have declined in abundance over the five year period from 2005 to 2009 by 82%. Pronghorn populations are closely monitored by the Wyoming Game and Fish Department and by wildlife biologists biologists contracted by the BLM in the Pine Delana Klein gas field. This map again clearly shows collared pronghorn locations within the Green River Basin all the way to the fences along I-80, Interstate 80. Consider the threats to pronghorn habitat. As densities of wells, roads, and facilities increase, Habitats within and near well fields become progressively less effective until most animals no longer use these areas, or if they remain, are, subject, are subjected to increased physiological stress. Physical or psychological barriers lead to fragmentation of habitats, further limiting access to effective habitat. These impacts are especially problematic when they occur within or adjacent to crucial crucial winter ranges and reproductive habitats. Here we can see cheatgrass where it is proliferating in the Pine Delanocline and Jonah gas fields. Erosion from the well pads pour sediment into the streams and rivers. Russian thistle is everywhere on the pads and habitat degradation and fragmentation are the primary drivers of population declines. Hydraulic fracturing, wastewater pits, and water treatment facilities pollute surface water sources, intermittent streams, and underground aquifers. This desert gets an average of between seven and 10 inches of precipitation a year, and every drop is precious for pronghorn. Flaring and venting of benzene, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, plus volatile organic compounds, have put the Upper Green River Basin into an EPA-designated ozone non-attainment area. This creates hazardous air quality for pronghorn and humans alike. The path of the pronghorn story has been told many times. In the Washington Post, New York Times, Smithsonian, National Geographic, Christian Science Monitor, High Country News, and Mother Jones. In Wyoming, the Casper Star Tribune, Jackson Hole News and Guide, Wildfile, and the University of Wyoming Haub School of Natural Resources have all published stories about the path of the pronghorn. But still, we are losing our pronghorn. Despite tens of millions of dollars spent on conservation easements, overpasses, and fence modifications, we are losing them. This winter alone, with its deep snow, prolonged extreme cold, and disease, at least 50% of the sublet pronghorn herd has perished. The full extent of this winter's mortality is yet to be seen. The Western Governors Association proposed migration corridor policy resolutions in 2007 and 2019, but then drew back under pressure from powerful opponents. The Western Governors wrote, daily and seasonal fish and wildlife migration corridors and habitat are necessary to maintain healthy populations of numerous fish and wildlife species. Traditional wildlife migratory routes and aquatic habitat connectivity, however, can be impeded, degraded, or eliminated by land or resource development. These policy resolutions can no longer be found at the Western Governor's website. In 2020, the Governor of Wyoming issued an executive order called 
Wyoming, Wyoming Mule Deer and Antelope Migration Corridor Protection. Governor Mark Gordon wrote, each executive branch agency in Wyoming shall exercise its legal and regulatory authorities to protect the annual movement of mule deer and antelope between seasonal ranges in their respective designated migration corridors. But in three years, there has not been one more migration corridor designation. The governor has caved under polit political pressure and the powerful oil and gas and agricultural industries. Also in 2020, the Federal Department of Interior recognized the importance of protecting migration corridors on BLM lands with Secretarial Order 3362. This created a very big pot of money for quote, mitigation projects, allegedly to protect migration corridors. Still, it's not enough. Down at the local levels of the Bureau of Land Management, bureaucrats have been instructed to ensure, quote, to ensure habitat connectivity, permeability, and resilience is restored, maintained, improved, and or conserved on public lands, quote unquote. However, the BLM has clearly stated in the instruction, instruction memorandum that they will not, will not designate migration corridors on public lands they manage. Let's take a look at the Green River Bay Basin public lands management that has occurred. Oh, sorry. I have to choose my okay. I have to choose my screen. Sorry, I'm gonna share my other screen. There you go. Okay. My screen share is loading. There we go. All right. So let's take a look at Green River Basin public lands management that has occurred over the past few decades. Will, can you see that screen okay? All right, good. So here is a map of Wyoming with colored, mule, with colored pronghorn locations in the upper Green River Basin. These locations stretch from Green River, Green River, Wyoming, and north the Grand Teton National Park. The areas in purple show pronghorn crucial winter ranges in the Green River Basin. Where pronghorns seek shelter in the worst winters. Pronghorn use vast areas of their ranges for food and shelter as the seasons change. Pronghorn traditionally use habitats in the area approved by the BLM, now called the Normally Pressured Lands or NPL natural gas field with 3,500 natural gas wells and associated pipelines, roads, infrastructure, tank batteries, equipment storage, and rights of way. So that area in yellow is the approved Normally Pressured Lands gas field. And you can see the use of pronghorn throughout that field. The state of Wyoming auctions state land for oil and gas development. Here in red are the 640 acre sections that have been leased for development from 2017 to 2023. The Bureau of Land Management also auctions public land for oil and gas development. Here in blue 
are parcels of various sizes that have been leased for oil and gas development in the Green River Basin from 2016 to 2023. Prior to 2016, here are the existing oil and gas leases in the Green River Basin. And here are the oil and gas wells existing in the Green River Basin. So as you can see, Pronghorn have basically a wall of wells and oil and gas leases during their annual migration to and from Grand Teton National Park to the Green River Basin. I'm gonna turn those off for a minute. This map will be, a, be available at the Upper Green website, by the way, when we're all done. I'll leave that on, then turn those off. And the Upper Green River Alliance, advocates for the West, and all of our partners now ask the governor of Wyoming and the Bureau of Land Management to designate the path of the pronghorn that connects Grand Teton National Park with the Upper Green River Basin. The path of the pronghorn is the traditional migration route between winter, spring, summer, and fall ranges, and is a tenuous thread that is so close to being severed by the NPL gas field. We all seek connection. We connect with the power of the sun with solar collectors. We hike, ski, walk, and run to connect to the power of this earth. And when we break those connections with the people, birds, and animals around us, we are lonely and lost. We ask that you help to keep these connections and what we all love about Wyoming, our tradition and our legacy. This is the pronghorn pathway. Scientists have completed their studies on pronghorn, journalists have published their stories, and governments have postured. It's up to us now. We ask that you use your power with your music, art, writing, and voice together. Our message is this, protect the path of the pronghorn now and forever. We ask you to write Governor Mark Gordon and Secretary of Interior Deb Halen respectfully request that they designate and protect the path of the pronghorn now because it's not just ours, it's our turn. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. That was wonderful. Um, really, really powerful. So now I'm going to talk about, uh, and by the way, my name is Sarah Stelberg. For those of us who joined a little bit late, I'm a staff attorney with Advocates for the West. And along with Linda and the um, folks at the Center for Biological Diversity and Western Watersheds Project, we uh, have a, a case trying to protect the path of the pronghorn from this oil and gas project um, that threatens to completely sever the path called the Normally Pressured Lands Project. I'm gonna start my slideshow here. All right. So Linda showed some great maps kind of orienting you on where the path of the pronghorn is. Um, again, the, the pronghorn summer up in uh, Grand Teton National Park in Jackson, which is about 60 miles from this project, and continue on south of the project area. What you see in red here is the boundaries of this normally pressured lands oil and gas project. 
Um, just a quick overview of what it will entail. This is um, a, a natural gas project. A lot of the oil and gas projects we deal with involve both natural gas and oil, but this is natural gas exclusively. It's a huge project, 3,500 oil and gas wells, a 10-year project. Most of the um, wells will actually stay on the landscape for longer than that, as will the roads and power lines and all kinds of disturbances. Um, Linda showed some great photos that represent the kinds of industrial facilities that it accompany this type of project. So you get open pits of toxic substances, you get uh, additional roads cut into the landscape, large well pads that flatten the earth and result in erosion and invasive, invasive species. Um, and uh, for those worried about climate change, this particular project is going to result in a huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions equivalent to 11 cold fire power plants operating for four decades. So these are just some photos of what this type of project looks like on the landscape. And I'm sure you can imagine if you're pronghorn, this is not a particularly attractive piece of habitat. Um, this shows a drill rig there rising up into the sky. This is what it looks like when the projects have been drilled. And you can see they still are pr pretty intrusive on the landscape and um, result in vegetation loss for pretty large areas. And one of the main concerns with this type of project, this shows you kind of the um, what a typical well pad might look like where they fill it, they flatten the earth and fill it with gravel and then build the infrastructure on that. This is actually um, in the NPL project area. So you can see it's not only the actual facilities that we're concerned about, but also the, the traffic, the truck traffic, the noise, the human presence that pronghorn tend to avoid. This was on a site visit that we did. This is also on a site visit. Um, and if you look at the bottom of the photo there, this is this is an area that supposedly was reclaimed from a past oil and gas project. And you can see it's just dirt and weeds, uh, not habitat, not going to provide good food for uh, pronghorn. And this is this is what BLM says is going to restore wildlife habitat at the end of this type of project. Um, this, I just love this photo because it shows you it's just a it's a beautiful landscape. You can see the Wind River Range there in the background. Um, but again, trucks driving down the road. Um, and this is just a project that's going to completely take over this valley. All right. So here again is the path of the pronghorn. And what you see in yellow, orange, and red there are three massive oil and gas projects that have already been stamped into the region. And the NPL project is the third. And the reason why this is such a concern is Pronghorn have already started avoiding these other two projects and have basically been squeezed into two narrow bands that, um, that they use now. And the NPL project would basically cover both of them. Um, I don't know, if, can you see my cursor there, Will? Yeah, so this is the NPL project here. Um, Right here in orange is the Jonah project, and then this is the Pinedale Anticline project in yellow. These are the ones that were extensively studied that Linda talked about, and we know that Pronghorn basically abandoned this la landscape after the oil and gas projects came in. And then the NPL project would uh, basically complete, complete the, the severance of that uh, migration path there. This is a map showing the uh, density of the wells that have come in. It's pretty remarkable. You can actually see the Jonah Field from space, the, the lights from the, the facilities and the flaring. Uh, the NPL project again here is in pink and would sort of fill in, not at this density, but would fill this entire area in with, uh, with wells. Not just pronghorn that use this landscape, which is pretty typical for areas that serve as high quality habitat, they tend to be favored by many species. And in this case, the sage grouse uh, likes this exact same habitat and it, um, it contains the, the country's only known winter concentration areas where our uh, where birds flock in the winter, thousands of sage grouse. We don't fully understand why they do this, but you can see all of the green circles here that surround, again, this is the project area in red, 
all of these green circles are breeding grounds. Um, and this is where sage grouse spend or kind of the focal point of their habitat the rest of the year. And then all of these birds flock to this, this area in brown here, which is their winter concentration areas. They come from all around in extraordinary concentrations um, that scientists don't fully understand. But the project area would cover basically all of these winter concentration areas. Um, so that was another main concern. In addition to the, the path of the pronghorn, this habitat would be effectively rendered useless because like pronghorn, sage grouse also avoid oil and gas development. So just uh, you know to kind of hit the highlights of what Linda already um, covered so well, these corridors are important not just to provide safe passage, but also the the pronghorn don't just keep moving; they actually stop along the way to 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 eat, to um, take advantage of the habitat, um, trail food, so to speak, and so. Uh, they they rest at certain places, and one of the problems with these oil and gas projects or any kind of human human disturbance is it tends to um, prevent these stopovers. They animals rush through at kind of a, a higher than natural pace, and they don't get the same nutrition that they ordinarily would. Um, the other thing that's important about uh, migration corridors is if you if you sever these corridors, you lose these the connectivity between distinct populations which are incredibly important to uh, genetic variability if uh, for example a wildlife a wildfire were to destroy one portion of the animal's range uh, this allows them to sort of seek refuge in other habitats so they're incredibly important to the survival of species and then just a, a couple of highlights again on, on how pronghorn react to oil and gas development. We know they dis, they avoid disturbances by up, up to uh, six tenths of a mile. They also really don't like habitat that's been fragmented. So where you have, you know, like a, a road here, a, a well pad here, even if the entire area isn't disturbed, they don't like areas that have, have this sort of fragmented human disturbance. So preserving broad swaths of intact habitat is important to them, as it is for sage grouse as well. As I mentioned, they pass through these gas fields relatively quickly, and so they, um, they end up not getting the same nutrition, so it reduces their fitness and overall survival. And we also know that they don't habituate like some other animals to oil and gas development. So this is not something where they, you know, they'll acclimate to the presence of these facilities on the landscape. This is one of my favorite photos. This is from the Jonah Field, just north of the MPL project area. Probably a worst case if you're going to develop an oil field or natural gas field. Um, you can see this is habitat fragmentation. Uh, you can imagine a pronghorn on the landscape here trying to work its way through this maze and find some undisturbed habitat. And this is sort of the worst case of, of how a project can go into landscape because it fragments the entire swath of habitat. So uh, a lot of folks commented on this project. The path of the pronghorn was uh, a, a huge concern during the comet period. And one of the proposals that rose to the surface was a buffer zone around the path of the pronghorn. And what commenters had, had suggested was that BLM prohibit development on the path and require horizontal drilling to basically reach the oil on, or, or the gas underneath the migration corridor from wells sighted far enough away that animals could continue the migration. Uh, commenters also suggested that BLM impose density restrictions to limit the fragmentation and the, just the overall disturbance so that pronghorn could still inhabit this area. And commenters also uh, requested a phase development approach where only portions of the project area would be disturbed at any given time, and then the remainder of the project area would remain uh, intact habitat so they could use uh, portions of the project area at any given time and not have the entire uh, landscape disturbed at once. This is an, just a visual depiction of the phase development plan. Um, BLM rejected all of these proposals. Um, as for the buffer, the path of the pronghorn buffer, um, 
instead of prohibiting development, uh, Jonah Energy, the developer, said that it will work to better understand and, if possible, preserve migration routes in the project area. So completely unenforceable uh, commitment and uh, one that, of, of course, if possible, um, is completely subjective and one that wouldn't necessarily prohibit them from um, from severing the migration corridor. BLM also rejected the phased development approach without explanation and also refused to adopt the disturbance cap that science shows is necessary to avoid uh, severe wildlife impacts. Uh, so after the decision was issued and BLM had rejected all these proposals, advocates for the West um, filed suit on behalf of the Upper Green River Alliance, Western Watersheds Project, the Center for Biological Diversity. Um, and this is a case, I should say, we're working with attorneys at the Center for Biological Diversity. And we had three main claim, claims in the case, two claims regarding the environmental analysis, the environmental impact statement that accompanied the project arguing that BLM failed to adequately study the adverse effects on both pronghorn and sage grouse, and that BLM also unreasonably rejected the uh, buffer, the, the uh, buffer alternative to protect the path of the pronghorn. And then our third claim um, related to phase development. Uh, the land use plan actually requires a phase development approach unless BLM provides a, a demonstrates that an exception applies, and they didn't demonstrate that one of those exceptions applied. So we brought a claim challenging the failure to impose phase development. This is just a quick update on where we are in the case. We lost in district court, which we sort of knew would happen going in. The District of Wyoming is not a favorable forum for environmental litigation for reasons I'm sure you can um, guess. Uh, we are now in the Tenth Circuit. We are we we finished briefing uh, this spring, and actually, oral argument is going to happen on May seventeenth. So we are hopeful about the appeal. If anyone would like to tune in, you can actually go to the Tenth Circuit website and watch that argument. Um, and the relief we're, requ we're requesting, and I want to make just a couple points about this, is to vacate the project approval. So you know, one thing I always like to tell clients and just you know, a thing that's important about the work we do is we can win a case, but it takes a lot of work after that to make sure that the agency does the right thing. Projects get reapproved. It's sort of a, a constant whack-a-mole. Um, and so if we succeed, we'll get the project approval vacated, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the project won't move forward at all. Um, and so uh, Linda's appeal to um, to the audience and you know to our elected officials to make sure that the path is designated, I think is critically important to make sure that um, you know that this this issue has elevated importance with our political officials. So just some ideas for what do we do? How do we how do we um, get the path protected? And I think one one thing that makes this particular migration corridor unique is that 90% of the route is actually in the hands of the federal government on federal public lands, both managed by the Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. So BLM has the authority to prohibit development in the migratory um, in the in the path of the pronghorn. It could do that on its own through restrictions on this project. It could amend its land use plans to require that. It could designate this as an area of critical environmental concern, um, which could give it elevated status in project decision making. And then I also wanted to flag that I think there's already some existing work to use conservation easements to keep the 10% of private land passable to sort of bridge the gap between federal and private. So that's all I had. Um, and I think now we are going to open it up for questions. All right. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Linda. Uh, we do have time for some questions and answers, and we have some questions. Um, I will start, let's see, with this one here. Uh, thanks all. This seems like deja vu all over again. BLM um, said the same thing in, adv in advance of Jonah and Anticline that adaptive management would be sufficient in addressing adverse effects. This question is for Linda. 
Does BLM acknowledge that its former wildlife and habitat protection claims and strategies uh, for, the ant, for the Jonah anticline failed? And how do, do they claim it would be better this time? Well, I don't think BLM is going to acknowledge that they failed at any juncture, personally, but, but other people have acknowledged it. Um, we have seen, uh, as as Sarah said, the avoidance of both pronghorn and mule deer in the existing gas fields, the Pine Delano Klein and the Jonah Field. Um, we have scientific studies that have gone on for many years, showing um, avoidance of the best habitats and um, animals moving to habitats that are less than optimal, uh, which has contributed to population declines. We've seen the comparisons of the control areas and the treatment areas, wherein the treatment area of the pine dolanocline had uh, a lower, a, a smaller population of, of mule deer, for example, um, than in the control area. Um, so, uh, and the, the whole adaptive management strategy um, has failed. We had, we had, um, the Pine Delanocline Working Group going for, for quite a few years in which uh, monitoring was required, um, but that whole adaptive management um, um, federal advisory committee fell apart as well. So um, now, um, and, and mule deer have, have hit a, a plateau where there was a, there was a, a point at which the, uh, when mule deer, uh, populations declined in the Pine Delanocline to a certain point, there was going to be quote unquote mitigation. Well, that happened three times and still BLM um, is responding. Well, BLM's not responding. Other people are responding with uh, various kinds of attempts at mitigation that have not worked. So, <laughs> so long answer is, uh, that's the long answer. The short answer is no. <laughs> BLM has not um, other than publishing the uh, the reports, the annual reports of the population, uh, the wildlife populations on the anaconda, they have not acknowledged failure. <laughs> yeah. uh, we have an attendee who would like to learn more about the 10% easement work on private land um, and, and also what can be done at the local county level. Yeah, I can I can just quickly speak from my very limited knowledge about the the easement work and Linda, feel free to correct me or add to this. Um, I think the work has lar largely been to uh, preserved ranches uh, that have not been developed currently, and just to to make sure that those you know additional houses or structures don't go in on those. I think there's a is it the Jackson Land Trust? I can't remember who it is that's um, uh, coordinating coordinating these efforts, but um, yes, there is there is some work being done on the local level um, with private landowners. And I'm not sure what the um, what the person is referring to with the 10% easement rule, but I think it has to do with um, if if an oil and gas lease falls more than 90% in a, a, a mule deer corridor. I think that's what it was about, that the lease would have special stipulations attached to it. Not, but, um, but, but getting to following um, what Sarah said, um, there have been uh, conservation easements in the Upper Green River Basin to the tune of $35 million. Um, so that includes um, a whole pot of money for the landowner. Um, plus a tax break, plus in some cases uh, fence modification, so they get a free fence. But um, given the amount of money that for conservation easements and for uh, wildlife overpasses and underpasses, there there's no a, a attached monitoring to, or baseline data collection that goes along with that. So um, it's a double-edged sword because conservation easements prevent um 
prevent subdivision development, but they there's no proof that they do anything for wildlife. <laughs> okay, for our next question, um, has Tracy Stone Manning take a, taken a position on this? And perhaps I'll add to this a little bit. Um, oftentimes within the context of the litigation that Advocates for the West is working on, we can um, achieve a favorable settlement that, you know, gets some of the protections that we're looking for um, in, in, for the, the issue at hand, the, the, um, the, the values at hand. Can you um, perhaps, uh, Sarah or, or Linda, um, walk us through um, whether that is, is still a possibility in this case, if, you, if so, yes, or if, if yes, why or, or why not? Yeah, I, I always like to think settlement or hope that settlement is a possibility. Um, we have pursued settlement talks in this case with fairly modest requests, mostly trying to save um, some of the most critical wildlife habitat, and including the path of the pronghorn. Um, nothing came of that. And, you know, I have some speculation about why that is, but I'll, I guess what I'll say is oil and gas production has become an incredibly political issue due in large part to gas prices. Um, and anything that's seen as um, increasing prices at the pump, increasing, you know, household expenses was sort of a, um, a non-starter. So what we what we've experienced in a lot of our oil and gas work is a reluctance to engage in settlement talks um, that on issues that we thought this administration would take a different stance on. So I think it's largely just the politics at the national level. Um, I think the administration would say that they believe that this project has adequate safeguards on it. And we know that isn't demonstrated in the science. We know based on experience that we've seen those commitments before and they haven't worked. But, you know, I think there may be uh, officials in the administration who think differently about what's going to happen as a result of this project. Yeah, and I would add to that, um, both the BLM and Interior have um, published instruction memorandums or uh, policy um, adjustments that attempt to uh, provide protection for migration corridors um, down at the local level. But, um, but as far as Interior goes, Interior has specifically said that they're not going to designate any more migration corridors. Um, BLM probably isn't either. <laughs> so, you know, they can say they want to protect migration corridors. They're going to do everything they can to identify migration corridor habitat. But identifying them and saying, look, there it is, is a very different thing than saying, yeah, here is a designation, the continuation of the designation that the Forest Service already has done. The Forest Service. So BLM is next. They really need to step up. Thank you both for answering that. And I want to ask a follow up. Um, we've we've talked a lot this evening about designation of of um, migration corridors, both within the context of um, uh, uh, Wyoming Governor Gordon. Um, actually, if I understand correctly, uh, uh, through executive order uh, designating corridors, as well as the potential for the BLM, who says they're not involved or they're not interested in doing that. If when we're talking about designating migration corridors, can you kind of walk us through what level of protection that would offer? Would it um, preclude the ability for leasing in some areas for oil and gas? Would it simply place um, restrictions on, on how development of wells could take place. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I can, I can take a stab. I, I think the line on the map is always the first step in, in long-term protections. Designation alone won't come with protections, but unless you have the path designated on the map and can kind of identify where protection should be applied, BLM can't 
put those into its resource management plan. So once you have the designation, what can happen is BLM, when it revises the uh, land use plan for this area, could put that type of protection in will that you mentioned, saying this area is closed to new oil and gas leasing, or this area is um, open to leasing but can't have any wells actually physically on top of it. You have to access the, 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 the gas from underground. Um, or you know any 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 kind of protections that BLM might think are appropriate, um, but without the designation, none of that is really possible. It could come from the state level, um, but whether that's politically possible in the state, I just I I'm not sure. But um, I guess the point is, it's far more likely once it's designated that BLM will undertake those protections in its land use plan. Yeah, and the Pinedale BLM all has a, a relatively new resource management plan, but there could be an amendment or a, re a revision of that RMP. Um, it probably wouldn't affect exist existing leases, um, but as you saw, the path that we're talking about sort of threads the needle between existing leases and existing wells. Um, it was surprising to me to see that when I put that map together. Um, and so, as Sarah said, if there was um, if there was a designation, and let's say it's two miles across, a mile on either side, um, directional drilling is done all the time now uh, um, in in all the gas fields around here, anyway, um, up to five miles away. So yeah, they can drill underneath that designated corridor, um, and with the um, with the the lack of drilling right now. Um, it, it wouldn't seem to be terribly impactful to the oil and gas industry, at, at least in my opinion. Um, and so um, I, I think, uh, and, and the BLM has a policy too, that in an RMP, they, they, can, they can do that. They can designate a corridor like that. So um, I'm hopeful that, um, especially with the condition of our pronghorn populations right now, that the BLM will see fit to do that. Um, I don't think the state will, and the state doesn't, well, the state has influence over what the feds do, but they don't really like to try to tell the feds what to do or vice versa. <laughs> Are there other animals that follow this same migration path, the path of the pronghorn? Um, and I think we're talking about migration specifically here. Um, if so, how does that play into the overall issue? Yeah. Well, as Sarah's map showed, it seems that sage grouse selects are positioned and, and sage grouse um, uh, nesting and brood rearing habitat also happen to fall relatively close to that migration corridor. Mule deer definitely follow very similar, at least through the same bottlenecks, the one at Trapper's Point where that overpass was built was built specifically for, well, the overpass was built for the pronghorn, the underpasses were built for the mule deer, but the Wyoming Game and Fish Department has known about that particular bottleneck and the other bottlenecks, the one up in, uh, by Grand Teton Park and in the Grovant Range and crossing the Green River and a couple other places. They have known about these for over 30 years. They've been studied forever, uh, not forever, but you know, for 30 years. So um, yes, there are other animals and, and Along the way, um, in very similar habitats are also some um, species of critical environmental concern like pig, pygmy rabbits and mountain plovers. Okay, um, next question. The Biden administration claims it is about helping public land agencies manage to achieve resiliency as a strategy for confronting climate change. Resiliency is vital to protecting wildlife that will need more room to roam. Developing corridors, and when we say developing corridors, I think we're talking about developing, say, you know, oil and gas within uh, migration corridors, uh, would seem to undermine that. How would you rate the Biden administration in its understanding of what's at stake? That's a, a great question. Um, and sort of provides the answer. I mean, I, I think it uh, 
yeah, wildlife corridors are incredibly important to resiliency. And this goes back to that point about population connectivity and wildlife need migration corridors to reach habitat. And if you sever them, you lose options available in case of fire, in case of, you know, uh, vegetation changes, if you if the habitat quality decreases. So yes, absolutely loss of migration corridors can be a huge factor in, um, in resiliency of species to a changing climate. I don't have anything to add to that, but um, species do reproduce. And as they access the habitats they need with the forage that they need um, to, to, to maintain their, bo their body fat during the winter so that they can give birth to a healthy offspring in the spring, um, that I guess is a, the definition of resiliency and that's how, and, and how they, they get to those habitats is through migration quarters, just like Sarah said. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Linda, and thank you, Sarah. That was the, the last question that we had this evening. Thank you for highlighting how important it is that we protect these critical wildlife migration corridors, such as the path of the pronghorn and, and how we might uh, work to actually achieve as much. Um, thank you for our, uh, to our attendees for your thoughtful questions this evening. Important conservation work that groups like Advocates for the West and the Upper Green River Alliance is doing is made possible thanks to supporters like you who are with us tonight. If you feel inspired, we do hope that you will give a gift to help us continue this important work. I will be sending uh, out an, an email uh, following tonight's webinar that includes links to ways that you can support us and to the recording of tonight's webinar uh, on YouTube. Please feel free to share it with folks who you think might be interested in our work. We also hope you will join us for our next Voices for the West webinar on May 31st. We will discuss our challenge of the Federal Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service over its pesticide spraying on millions of acres in 17 Western states. This is a case Advocates for the West is fighting with our partners at the Center for Biological Diversity and Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation. So stay tuned in the weeks ahead for more info on that webinar. And with that, I hope everyone has a wonderful evening. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.